This video is looking at three topics, 2.6, 2.7, and 2.9, membrane transport, facilitated diffusion, and mechanisms of transport. As was explored in a previous video, we know that cell membranes are the surfaces through which cells obtain required materials and expel waste products. Because of the construction of the cell membrane, it can regulate the passage of substances based on those substances' chemical properties and structure. Some particles may travel directly through the plasma membrane, while others may require transport proteins to assist them. While some molecules move down their concentration gradient, in other cases, cells can effectively hoard materials by moving them against their concentration gradient into the cell. Molecules and ions move across the plasma membrane in one of two ways relative to their concentration gradient. They move with their concentration gradient or against it. The transport of a particle passively involves the movement of that particle from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. This could be analogized by an object rolling down a hill. In order for that object to continue its downward travel, no additional input of energy is required. Active transport, however, is the opposite of this as it involves the movement of particles up a concentration gradient. Moving a molecule or ion from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration does require the additional input of energy. All forms of transport that we're going to study can be categorized into one of these two groups, passive transport or active transport. We will begin with simple diffusion. Underneath the name of each type of transport, you'll notice a reference to a set of key features about that form of transport. Simple diffusion, or just diffusion, is one of the most common and important processes in nature. It is the process by which like particles spread out and occupy larger volumes as they collide with one another, moving farther away. As they do so, they travel from areas where they are more densely concentrated to areas where they are less so. This phenomenon can be demonstrated by food coloring diffusing into a container of water or the odorant molecules given off by freshly baked cookies diffusing from the oven and kitchen throughout the rest of the house. It also explains why the smoke from distant forest fires can create a haze in the air hundreds of miles from the source. Diffusion into or out of a cell is only different from those examples in that particles travel across a membrane. They travel from the side of the membrane where the particles are in a high concentration to the side of the membrane where there is a lower concentration. There are two important features of simple diffusion that must be kept in mind. The first is that different kinds of particles diffuse independently of one another. Let's use this graphic to explain that point. On the left of a gray color-coded selectively permeable membrane, are 12 orange particles, and on the right, six purple ones. At first, you may be tempted to describe the left side of the membrane as an area of higher concentration relative to the right. After all, there are more particles on the left. However, because those two particles are not the same, there are in fact two concentration gradients. The concentration gradient for the orange particle is high on the left, and low on the right. But the concentration gradient for the purple particle is high on the right and low on the left. This explains why we observe the orange particle diffusing down its concentration gradient from left to right, and the purple particle diffusing down its own concentration gradient from right to left. The movement of particles based on their own concentration gradients do not interfere with or influence one another. The second point to remember about diffusion has to do with equilibrium. Equilibrium does not mean that particle movement or transport stops. It only means that the net movement stops. 
So once equilibrium is achieved for every orange particle, for example, one that goes from the left to the right means another one will go from the right to the left. Osmosis is a very special type of diffusion. While simple diffusion refers to the movement of solutes across a membrane, osmosis is the diffusion of the solvent. As you can observe in this computer animation, water molecules travel across the membrane with relative difficulty. The computer animated water molecule begins its journey on the left of the membrane, and once it's in the hydrophobic core where all of the phospholipid tails are, the water molecule begins jumping around erratically as those hydrophobic fatty acid tails and the water are repellent to one another. For a long time, scientists struggled to explain how water could travel from one side of a membrane to another. It wasn't until the 1990s that scientists discovered the presence of transport proteins for water called aquaporins. These aquaporins are transmembrane proteins that provide channels whereby water can move from a hypotonic solution to a hypertonic one. The interiors of aquaporin channels have charged regions that attract water molecules and assist them in their travel. Water traveling through an aquaporin protein from one side of a membrane to another is actually a great segue into our next type of transport, facilitated diffusion. Some substances, because of their chemical properties, may be prevented from traveling directly through the phospholipid bilayer. Ions, for example, because of their charged nature, are unable to exist in the water-free environment of the membrane's hydrophobic core. They would therefore rely on transport proteins that are specific to a given ion type. In one type of facilitated diffusion, channel-mediated, transmembrane proteins provide a channel for small charged ions to travel through. These transport proteins essentially form tunnels through which the particle can travel down its concentration gradient. Another form of facilitated diffusion is called carrier-mediated facilitated diffusion. This kind of transport is most commonly utilized for moving large hydrophilic molecules. It begins when the molecule to be transported binds to its transport protein using chemical interactions such as ionic bonds, hydrogen bonds, or van der Waals interactions. This binding is molecule and transport protein specific, meaning that each kind of molecule that travels across the membrane in this fashion would require its own type of transport protein. Once binding has been achieved, that results in a conformational shift in the transport protein's three-dimensional structure. The protein's shape change forces the molecule through the membrane. Many molecules are transported across cell membranes against their concentration gradients, from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. Cells may do this to stockpile raw materials like glucose and amino acids, or to establish and maintain concentration gradients of ions on either side of the membrane. Although there are a variety of transport mechanisms to accomplish this, one of the most well-studied and well-known examples is the sodium-potassium pump. The sodium-potassium pump is a transmembrane protein present in all animal cells. Its function is to transport three sodium ions out of the cell and exchange them for two potassium ions being transported into the cell. Because this transport is moving both types of ions against their concentration gradients, energy is required in the form of ATP. As long as an animal cell is alive and has the ATP necessary, the sodium-potassium pump is functioning every second of every minute of every hour of every day. The result is the establishment and maintenance of a concentration gradient of both sodium and potassium ions. Sodium is present in a greater concentration outside the cell, and potassium 
is in a greater concentration inside the cell. So now let's take a look at why those established concentration gradients are so important. Co-transport is a mechanism that relies directly on and only functions due to concentration gradients of other particles. For example, the facilitated diffusion of sodium back into a cell can be coupled with the transport of glucose up glucose's concentration gradient. This co-transport, called symport, is actually secondary active transport and allows cells to move glucose from a low concentration to a high concentration. This is only possible because of the previously established concentration gradient of sodium ions, thanks to the perpetual efforts of the sodium-potassium pump. But it is not only glucose that is transported in this fashion. Calcium ions are transported out of cells in this way, as well as a variety of other ions and polyatomic ions like chloride, iodide, and phosphate. So far, we've seen examples of transport involving ions, water molecules, and other small molecules like glucose. But some cells have the ability to engulf or expel relatively large volumes of substances all at once. This process of endocytosis is one in which a cell extends its membrane around an item that it intends to engulf. As the cell membrane does so, the engulfed item is surrounded and trapped in the membrane that is eventually pinched off, forming a vesicle that is now inside the cell. This process is common feeding behavior in single-celled organisms and is also important as specialized immune system cells that travel around the body are charged with engulfing and destroying foreign invaders like bacteria and viruses. Exocytosis is the reverse process where a cell's vesicles from inside fuse with the cell membrane expelling their contents into the external environment. Let's take a look at one final set of examples that demonstrate the importance of many of these transport mechanisms. A neuron, also known as a nerve cell, are specialized cells found in animals that are responsible for detecting and responding to stimuli as well as regulating an animal's movement. How a neuron accomplishes this is through the transport of ions that alter the electrical charge of a membrane that all cells possess. Because of the action of the sodium-potassium pump, which maintains a state of disequilibrium, along with other intra- and extracellular solutes, cell membranes have an electric charge called membrane potential. That membrane potential can be measured using a voltmeter. Relative to the electric charges of batteries found in TV remote controls or a flashlight or your cell phone, the negative 70 millivolts of the inside of a cell's membrane is quite small. Most cells in the body maintain a consistent membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts. However, a couple kinds of cells can actually change their membrane potential. Those cell types include muscle cells and neurons. Now, let's watch a short video from the textbook publisher that will demonstrate how this is accomplished all by simply transporting ions. A neuron may generate an electrical signal known as an action potential that travels down the length of the axon. Let's take a closer look at the plasma membrane of an axon. Even without an action potential, the axon is a busy place with many ions moving across its membrane. Much of this ion movement is driven by the sodium-potassium pump. Using energy from ATP, sodium-potassium pumps actively transport sodium ions out of the cell and potassium ions in, creating an uneven distribution of charge across the membrane. Some potassium channels are open all the time, allowing potassium ions to leave the cell. As a result of these ion movements, the inside of the cell is negative relative to the outside. This condition is called the resting potential.
The membrane of an axon is also packed with gated ion channels that open and close during an action potential. At resting potential, the gated channels are closed. If a stimulus changes the distribution of charge across the membrane sufficiently, the gated sodium channels open. Movement of sodium ions across the membrane makes the inside of the cell more positive. This reversal of the charge distribution causes the gated sodium channels to close and the gated potassium channels to open. As potassium ions move out of the cell, the original charge difference is re-established across the membrane, closing the gated potassium channels. This sequence of events is called an action potential. The sodium-potassium pump restores the distribution of ions back to their previous levels at resting potential. So we can see that transport mechanisms are about far more than just moving stuff from one place to another. As seen in the example of neuronal function, they are responsible for making the far more complex processes that those cell types are involved with possible. Responding to internal and external stimuli, triggering and controlling the movement of muscle, and even our cognition and memories can all be traced back to the movement of ions across a membrane. So on that mind-blowing revelation, these topics have come to an end. As always, thank you for watching. Take care.